Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, we're back with the channel Hoser, and he's done a video that is kind of popping off right now. It's called How Not to Run a Country. Now, the thumbnail has Iran on it, and Iran has a fascinating history. We've been talking about the Iranian Revolution in my class recently, so it's kind of on the top of my head. So I'm excited to check this out. All right, original video is down below. Make sure you are supporting Hoser. And if you were a channel member, you saw this video early. All right, let's get started. All right, so any discussion of current Iranian politics or anything has to involve some good context of the last few decades. And we'll see kind of how far back they go on this and see the approach. Iran should be rich, 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 rich. Oil, That's not a big oil producer. Hook or a wild overstatement. Iran should be a rich and prosperous nation. It's got wealth. It has a well-educated middle-aged population. They have tons of natural resources like oil, gas, copper and unique landscapes to grow unique crops and just look at what mineral wealth did for the other gulf states they have hey, an let's incredibly remember. strategic location let's, well all right let's remember too the persian empire was was goaded well situated for global trade and control possibly the most important 55 kilometer stretch of ocean on earth despite the mountainous and desert terrain iran has built up quite an impressive infrastructure by the way you probably heard just recently the uh president of iran died in those dangerous mountains there in a helicopter crash. ...network. They have more engineering students than America does, with the third highest number of engineers out of any country on Earth. And before the know revolution that. in 1979, Iran was a fast-growing economy with a rising affluent middle class. But... There's some reasons for that, and we'll see what they go to. Those are reading for a reason for that revolution. Iran is not According to Iranians. Rich. And I'll say that it did not have to be this way. They didn't have to have their output in a single decade. Millions of educated Iranian workers never had to sit idle waiting for a job. Incomes never had to be eaten away by a rapidly falling rial and widespread inflation. And Iranians should have never had to game the system to get ahead, either entering the black market or government service to avoid some of the highest corruption on earth. Mm. Had decisions been made differently in the past, Iran could very well have been a rich nation, or at least comparable to its neighbors in the south. I mean, just, it's not like they're, the, the nation still has so many assets for that too. But yeah, I mean, they're a theocracy. Um, it's pretty much dominated by the, you know, uh, um, it's the Islamic Republic of Iran, which again, the context goes back to the Iranian revolution, but uh, much of whatever government regime is going to be in there is at the behest, you know, of the Ayatollah and uh, yeah. Now, we shouldn't blame one single thing for this lost potential, but it's very, very, very difficult to ignore the massive revolution and societal changes Iran Good. went through Glad in he's 1979. Talking about it. Khomeini. Before Iran was a kingdom, yep. a fairly autocratic, paranoid kingdom, but one with a rising middle class, very autocratic. increased trade and better technology, with a sort of progressive movement found among the economic elites. Western Enlightenment values were common among the upper classes, hijabs and Islamic veils were banned for a brief period starting in 1936, and women got the right to vote in 1963. Secularism. Secularism. Uh, that's, that's the best term to use there. Uh, this regime was propped up and put into place by Western powers. I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, and the much of those benefits uh, economically went back to, you know, BP, British Petroleum, um, and the Americans as well. And that was the big grievance. And I'm sure I'll get into it more because I already talked about it. But um, the grievance was that that wealth and that the culture that was happening at this time, especially post-World War II, was Western in nature. Um, and it was uh, benefiting foreign nations. And the people were not benefiting from those resources like people felt they should. All of this was done through very top-down actions. The new values were never really taught in schools, typically run by religious authorities, but they were certainly embraced by what many saw as a decadent and corrupt elite. The regime alienated many rural the wealthy and monarchy, Iranians, powerful, solidifying their classic rule monarchy. network of secret police. The revolution which broke out was not organized. It was not for one specific goal. It was the realization of many, many different sects of society that they did not want to live under the Shah's rule anymore, eventually consolidating under the hardline Islamic sect of the revolution led by the Grand Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. I'm wondering if he's going to talk about uh, what happened when an elected, 
official was was chosen, Mohammed Mossadegh, who had a platform of nationalizing the resources of of uh, of Iran, and by that I mean basically just putting it in the ownership of Iranians and not say the British or any other foreign uh, group. And then there was a coup propped up by the CIA with uh, British assistance and kind of the British pushing it. That very popular guy in, in Mossadegh was um, basically a coup to take him out. And that was, for a lot of people, a kind of final straw because you had that Shah, but then you had he was driven out, and then you had uh, Mossadegh was um, was uh, voted in. And, of course, in this time, you got to talk about Cold War politics and uh, economic imperialism and capitalism and all those kind of things. And this was not something the British and the Americans, you know, stand for and have done this all over the world, where if a country is going to nationalize their uh, their natural resources that have previously been owned and operated by, you know, American powers and Western powers, that there will be and it happened a lot. There's going to be intervention, some kind of coup. Um, and it could be more direct, more indirect. That happened in Iran, which has fueled the Western hostility. And to be honest, brought um, a lot of ideas about Western style democracy um, into debate because it was like, well, this person was elected and then it but it wasn't the right person. So what is the goal of uh, a, a Western democracy? Is it this corrupt? This is what was being talked about in Iran, which leads to this guy going to power. The new Islamic Republic of Iran was now under the command of a supreme leader running an isolationist, oppressive, revolutionary new country. So you had him. He's, he's the Ayatollah, right? And he's an Islamic cleric. And the idea was also um, a return to or at least uh, an adherence to Islamic law, right? You got to understand, too, this is not out of a vacuum. There's other things that are going to be going on here, too. Um, this idea of westernization in uh, Islamic Middle Eastern countries was something happening all across the Middle East and in this part of Asia. Um, it's not, and yeah, it's a much larger context. We're about to get the war in Afghanistan as well, which is going to have a similar idea. It's called the Islamic Revival. It's in the 70s and in the 80s as a response to Western imperialism. And, a, and what they believe is to fight that, you return and unify based on a shared culture which was adherence to Islam. But he can't do his and job Islamic alone. law, Sharia. Under him is the Supreme National Security Council. So there's a president, the president and they vote and for parliament him. parliament are elected, but only with supreme leader approval. Yep. And the armies which keep peace Very sit partially democratic. Them. Iran has a couple of armies. There's the Artesh, which is the Republic's typical army. You know, big planes, big guns, big boats, focused Very on powerful military. external threats. There are the law enforcement forces, their border guards and police, and then there's the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC. This is a special army, about half the size of the Artesh, tasked with upholding the values of the Iranian Revolution in modern day society. To call them an army would be an understatement. The Revolutionary Guard is like the Army, Mafia, KGB, News Corp, and Siemens <laughs> that is put pow- together, just on Jeez. a smaller yeah. Iranian scale. That is powerful. When Iraq attacked the country in 1980... You can see revolution- when, when, when revolution happens, there's always a, a adherence to that. And when revolutions happen, it could be communists, you know... <laughs> It could be the French Revolution for how you know wild that was. They always try to keep in parts so you can always remember that revolution because often those revolutions are seen as you know positive and a sign of national pride, and you keep remnants of that to remind people. You know, China tried to uh, did that in the 1960s with the Cultural Revolution, and that had a lot of negative effects, you know, as well. But it was supposed to be a reminder of you know, the glory days of these revolutions. And you can see that with the, you know, their guard here, um, that they want to keep that there, that, hey, like, just because we had that revolution doesn't mean what we were fighting for doesn't matter anymore, you know. The guard turned into an army in its own right, growing its own command structures, intelligence networks, and a personal volunteer corps, the Basij. Their efforts to not win the war, but at least end it in stalemate eight years later, and then as a major driver in the post-war reconstruction, justified their consolidation to their supporters. Oh, and all for those resources too. Iran's about to go to war with Iraq. 
They fight for much of the 80s and was brutal, basically ended a stalemate with thousands, tens of thousands of people dead. As a political Hundreds, force, maybe. the IRGC and Boston Forget the exact numbers they ran Iraq war. presidency, but really solidified under the hard line of Ahmadi Najed, who transferred many assets from the government to the revolutionary organs yeah. of the government. Um, he also very, again, Iran has also always had a very harsh tone against Israel. And Akbadidijad was one of those two. I um, believe he was also kind of famous as like a Holocaust denier, if I remember right. So he was not seen very well by the outside world. Basij was dreamed up as a great 20 million man army. Jeez. But today, there's probably a little under a million Basij volunteers. They're the first ones to respond uh -huh. to any threat found inside of the regime protests internal enemies and supposed there are a american sponsored ethnic tension Fight this this regime is not universally supported there are protests there and yes some of them could be squashed or whatever it is but there are protests uh, there's actually a pretty decent one happening now by as most political revolutions come from um young kind of college age uh, uh young intellectuals that push for that because they are very much in touch with the outside world and want those benefits of maybe a freer, both politically, economically uh, type of society. And yeah, that's happening in Iran right now. And um, it kind of goes up and down, you know, at times and it's Getting pretty high right now. Kurdistan and Baloch. They're the ones to carry out most of the worst aspects of the government. They're the ones to beat protesters to broken ribs and noses, drag them off to black sites and basements and mosques to torture them in tiny cells, Repatriate them, who force yeah. many to sign a confession, sentencing them to death shortly after, to gun them of down death penalties, if there are too there. many in the protests, and to intimidate businessmen, politicians, and ordinary people to accept IRGC rule. The Basajis are the ones to control the entry points into the country being the first to profit off of smuggling. They're mm. the ones to build Bruh. national construction projects, bypassing local employment, but developing service and infrastructure in rural areas. It's like this, this group is judge, jury, and executioner, and at the direct will of, is it even what you call the state? Or just the Ayatollah, but again, the Ayatollah and the president, the whole cabinet there, basically work in unison. So basically of that upper political elite, so with it's always scary benefits, when we see well that in history perks like scholarships training social mobility and scooting out of 21 month mandatory military service it's no wonder why so many bossage you may be taught to uphold the revolution no matter what be the ones to suppress your fellow iranian and you may be the first killed in war but hey it pays decently well. <laughs> From the perspective of the government, the Bossage creates the most ideological fervor per unit of cost. A higher hmm, ranking Revolutionary Guard position pays even better though, with some officials earning about 100 times minimum wage. They hold a large amount of thought power over society, with four universities, two think tanks, and many media outlets. It, 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 that's par for the course. We see this in history of there's a reason a lot of militaries are powerful, and it's it's because people want to be in them. If you are automatically right going to dramatically improve the life for you and your family, whether it's pay, benefits, etc., you're going to have a, <laughs> a, a pretty good army. Look like the Romans, for example. The Romans, um, you got paid quite well. You had a great basically retirement bonus of land and, and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, you could see how that is going to be mutually beneficial for the state to have this military and for people to uh, be devoted to it because it's so much better in so many cases than what it probably is for most regular people. Like Kaihan and the Bossage News Agency, although the Supreme Council of the Cultural Revolution has final say over which websites contain illicit material. Remember this revolution was 1979. They hold many high positions in the many, many, many IRGC run companies, often not having to bid on auctioned off development projects, and they're the ones who send billions to internationally recognized terrorist groups. They pay the salaries of Hezbollah, Houthi, and Hamas fighters. Yeah. They aid. It's the famous thing that those groups are propped up by Iran without Iranian support. They could fizzle out. They could absolutely fizzle out. That's how Iran becomes so relevant in, you know, like Israel, Palestine, and anything that goes on in Syria. 
Um, the Americans are big allies, you know, of Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia and Iran have a lot of beef. Thousands of rebel Iraqis in destabilizing the country. Oh, by the way, also important to remember, too, something that's always distinguished Iran from the rest of the really Islamic world. Um, they're Shia. Um, they're the only state that is predominantly Shia. And that goes back a long time, too, which makes them a religious minority in the uh, Islamic world because, you know, Shia only make up, what, 10, 15 percent of, of all Muslims and most are Sunnis. Helped Assad's regime in Syria. Assad, in leader of Syria. Country. And they've helped Assad's regime in Syria, whose forces have killed over 300,000 and displaced 15 million stay afloat. Yeah. The supreme leader and Irani government not only don't condemn these guards, but they welcome them. Many parliamentarians and, and you can see that because it looks like a kind of a continuation of their Islamic cultural revolution. It's like those have little, I don't know, little, little pieces of it. And you you keep your cultural revolution alive that you want to keep, you know, perpetuating by supporting other ones that may have similarities. And they probably see that with say Hamas or, you know, Hezbollah. Officials hail from the guard themselves. They have an ideological and political chokehold over the country. A hundred actually thousand yeah. people hold eighty five million much. hostage. The world is not exactly I've, right. I've always asked myself I asked myself a lot when you know, I learn about like Israel, Palestine and stuff and, and, and other, um, you know, events there about why has Iran, Iran been so invested? And again, these are places, first off, Iranians don't, they don't, they're not Arabs and very much don't like to be put into that, right? They have a, a Persian ancestry. They speak a different language. Again, they are Shia, although there's Sunnis too, but you know, Shia, there's a lot of things that are very different about them. They don't like to even be really be called Middle Easterners in a lot of ways because they have a separate history because Middle Eastern, you know, often just gets conflated with Arab and Arab, if you're Middle Eastern or you're Arab, and again, the Iranians aren't. But uh, it's it's a question I've had in my mind before about why they get involved in those other areas like that where they have a lot of differences bypassing other countries. So you see like Iran support like Syria or like, uh, um, like Palestine, places they don't even, you know, border and have different histories. But now, I, as I'm watching this, it's kind of getting me this idea of what I was saying before, which is those things may look like elements of the Iranian revolution. And to keep the Iranian revolution relevant, you support those things. So it's almost like it's self-serving in a lot of ways, maybe for Iran. Anybody following me there? What do you what do you think of that? Like that that is why they um, they they, you know, support these other conflicts because it legitimizes their rule receptive to this group these are some reasons why iran is the second most sanctioned country on earth <laughs> first by sanctions that actually work also a nuclear Let's not program ourselves the political structure hurts the average person destroying their confidence in future growth but sanctions that's just killing the poor iranians from the islamic revolution to that the is a big thing you have to note about he's talking about you know is it iran a um, it says not to run a country, you know, a lot of that does come back because of those sanctions. Those are crippling sanctions. Um, the United States has been kind of on and off with them. There were sanctions forever. A lot of them got lifted with the Iranian deal to the Obama administration. And then that kind of went back under the, the Trump administration. So it's kind of on and off. Hey, America and its allies have blocked oil exports, embargoed trade with the country, particularly on arms, energy equipment and high technology and froze their assets, including interestingly, accounts, they haven't needed it. metals, even central bank reserves. It's almost an American presidential tradition to sign an executive order sanctioning <laughs> Iran from Jimmy Carter in 1979 in response to 52 American diplomats being held hostage to Donald Iranian Trump hostage in 2020 crisis. condemning a more general Iranian threat. So you see, it's it's um, it's it's doesn't matter the, the political party. OK, it's bipartisan. Reasons for these sanctions fall into three general categories. Iran's funding of terrorists, nuclear weapon development, and just general crimes against humanity. It's usually not on the entire country, though, but individual people and entities usually tied with the Revolutionary Guard or government, as well as those who do business with the sanctioned. It just so happens that this includes many of their most profitable businesses and human capacity to get things in and out of the country. It's because of that. I mean, it's so much because of the Iranian revolution, because there's plenty of those things 
that if they're talking about like women's rights or you know whatever there's still other uh, abuses of that in countries where the united states does have alliances with say saudi arabia but saudi arabia never did the iranian revolution they never did the hostage crisis and they never did that stuff so that is what i think has severed things so poorly and as long as the united states has an ally like saudi arabia it doesn't become nearly that important to have that kind of relation a more positive relationship with iran i guess it's just some the of my thoughts as i'm hearing this all the petro and gas refineries through the national iran oil company and the guard owns many of the nation's petrochemical and manufacturing refineries and ports so their production has been destroyed after sanctions particularly after they ramped up in 2012. but there was hope some countries, namely this one, were willing to reduce or even get rid of their sanctions in exchange for Iran swearing it will never develop a nuclear weapon. This was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, aka the Iran nuclear deal. Right. Many countries and most American citizens see it as critical for global safety that Iran never have access to nukes. Um, there were a lot of people very, very critical of this. Um, as well, because they're saying the United States isn't getting anything out of this other than like a promise, a pinky swear that Iran will not develop nuclear weapons. It could get in the hands of, you know, other people. They say it was like a one sided deal where the Americans were literally just giving up a lot of money too. there's a lot of economic aid that the United States was pumping in as well. And uh, this was not universally appreciated because, again, sanctioning Iran has been a bipartisan thing for decades. If they were to make them, not only would um, another yeah. ideologically yeah. strong dictator have the ability to destroy entire cities, but its neighbors would likely start developing these weapons as a counterbalance to their own security. That's it usually what happens. You develop nukes because someone else does. Place. If they get one, we have to get one. So these six nations were to negotiate with the Republic and monitor their progress in limiting weapon development. Their so uranium stockpile was capped. They were supposed to reduce the amount of centrifuges they had, and they would have to limit their enrichment level of uranium to 3.67%, where a weapon can only be made at around the 90% level. Um, I forgot if if there was going to be a committee or whatever to do investigations in Iran and, and keep them up and constantly be investigated to see if like they're trying to do this secretly. I forgot if that was its own committee made up of those people that signed it or if it was the UN. I can't remember, but he did make a very good point about people pursue nuclear weapons when, especially when someone that is a perceived enemy was to. And you saw that was uh, the royal family of Saudi Arabia that said if Iran got one, then Saudi Arabia is like, we want one, right? And the United States could supply that because they're allies, but you could see that. So it's an idea like if you keep, if you have Iran not do it then multiple countries will not pursue that and maybe that's seen as a win-win so that's kind of like the logic going into that deal they did this so iran could develop nuclear power but no weapons yeah. this required transparency into iranian labs military bases and research facilities but in exchange many sanctions were lifted in 2015 particularly on finance and oil exports Crude production shot back up to normal levels and inflation came down. It was still a little high, but much better than before. It seemed like Iran was accepted back into global no, the inflation's trade and back many up. citizens felt the benefits of it. This normalcy Iran sanctioned lasted, again uh, for three years. In 2018, negotiations broke down. Iran wasn't keeping their end of the deal. They were still hiding some of their bases and processing facilities, Ugh. still funding terrorist networks and destabilizing their neighbors, and had four American citizens detained. See, this is stuff, if you're the public in Iran, you're like, dude, things are getting better for our country, right? It's like, they're lifting the sanctions. We have no more economic opportunities. Inflation is going down, right? So people that are, are <laughs> in Iran that aren't, trying to fervently still hold on to this Iranian revolution of you know 50 years ago. Um, and it's a new generation that we're talking about now. And you're, once you're 50 years out, you get a new generation that doesn't have that tie. And they're like, this was a good thing. And then, then you're, you're ruining it by doing these other things that were against the deal. And you could see how, especially since about this time, 2018, um, there's been more protests against the regime. Although none of them have even come close to ever, you know, being able to like push them out or anything like that. 
The US was going through a bit of a famous isolationist period at the time, and in May 2018, it was announced they would no longer take part in the deal. Sanctions were reinstated on most entities. Inflation almost instantly shot up to around 40% where it's since Brutal. Stayed. The Riyal fell over 10 times in value since less people bought it to buy Irani goods and as officials printed money and spent from the sovereign wealth fund to cover the deficit. Jeez. Um, One thing I don't know, the other countries that were part of the deal, uh, what did they do after the U.S. pulled out? I don't remember. Many businesses closed, pushing around 10 million into poverty in Ugh. a country where almost a third are now in extreme poverty. With many Iranian shareholders in the stock market, the financial sanctions erased ordinary people's savings. Uh, Weapons trade increased with groups like the Houthis who have used them to attack Saudi Yemen. oil refineries and container ships in the Red Sea. Proxy war there. Houthis uh, out of Yemen, long been at odds with the Saudi Arabians. Iran supports them. Right. Proxy wars. Still got those going on. In Investment 2020s. from 2012 to 2022 and oil production halved until deals with China were made, giving them around a 20 to $30 discount because of their buying power over the Iranian government. Dude, this is what China does, by the way. The China sits back, sits back and watches for these events to swoop up. And it happens a lot. They wait for some financial collapse of somewhere. No one else is going to help them. They swoop in and then they reap a lot of benefits. And they make, to be honest, really good deals with these countries that are usually way better than any Western nation could come in, right? Better terms of loans and stuff like that. And China has benefited from this kind of stuff by staying out of it and then picking up the ashes. Iran up the ashes, is that a term? Getting rid of caps on stockpiles and banning the export of uranium. If America wouldn't play, neither would they. Huh. Then in 2020, Iran backed out of the deal after the high-ranking IRGC official US Hassan Soleimani was dude. killed by an American missile strike. Yeah. Sanctions are unlikely to ease up now as Iran strengthens its military operations. Well, it was interesting how little the pushback was um, other than that by, by Iran because you know, there are a lot of bases and other places, you know, around. And Iran, you know, had a very, very small response to their leading general, who I believe was actually uh, quite popular um, uh, being taken out. That the response was not nearly as big as maybe you would, might expect. But maybe it's just because Iran's like, don't want to escalate things even further, even though they felt this was a, a terrible wrong done by them selling drones to Russia and according to a UN report, nearly having enough enriched uranium for a bomb. <laughs> the point of sanctions is to cripple the economy either for officials to change their behavior or for those or hurt to rise up and force a behavior change. That doesn't... But because of the unique structure of Iran's economy, sanctions may have had no other effect than hurting the bulk of society with the politically powerful better off than before. Mm. Iran's economy is deeply entrenched with its politics. It's a predominantly state-run economy with roughly two-thirds of output coming through the government, in theory planned out by the Supreme Economic Coordination Council. <laughs> These state-owned companies are generally exempt from taxes, completely opaque with their finances, unaccountable, and have monopolized key industries. Ugh. Not just oil... All that means is their biggest resources and money makers in their country do not go to the people especially during times of crisis petrochemicals but manufacturing engineering and development too one example of this is the Qatam al anbiya construction headquarters this what is, is this? the irgc's engineering wing with over 800 various companies beneath it employing tens of thousands of engineers and planners Qatam has built all across Iran, thousands of projects from mines to dams to pipelines to rail to offshore rigs to import-export infrastructure. infrastructure to irrigation systems were from their hands. Chances are, if Public there's works. any sort of development project, Qatam and the construction busage are going to find their way into it. They often don't have to bid on auctioned projects. For example, this airport had been investment and partially built by the Turkish engineering firm <laughs> TAV. That means that somebody is making a fortune off of this because you don't have to compete for bids and stuff. That is where business and politics, two groups benefiting each other. It's incredible. It, 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 it's the grounds for an incredible amount of corruption. 
V before being seized and completed by the Rebels. Partially built by the Turkish engineering firm TAV before being seized and completed by the Revolutionary <laughs> Guard in 2004, they embezzle billions through these holding companies, like one case of 80 trillion riyals oh Yas Holding, and it's the only organization which has the ability to traffic through the sanctions. A lot of good because data in this video, of their by development the way. of many ports and their military power, the IRGC has control of course, over I don't know cities and entry points of the country. It's all true, but sanctions well, are powerful, but they can't stop everything from leaving and entering the country. Yeah. Through front companies, some sacrificial Because remember, business. not everyone's sanctioning them. I mean, there there's a handful of people, but like Russia, <laughs> China, they kind of do their own thing, and those are major, major trade partners. So really what it does is just benefits other countries. And if you're the United States, you're like, you know, you're you're staying out of this or you're trying to like punish Iran or something, but all you're actually doing is helping China and Russia. Men bound for the Office of Foreign Assets Controls list, and like the good old days of New York dock workers corrupt deals to get through hey. it's estimated that smuggling in the black market trade is around a third of the total trade in and out of iran the amount the irgc earns through smuggling around 15 to 16 billion is. annually could easily pay off the amount they getting around the sanctions overseas. it would also help in their weapons trade advanced tech research bribes nuclear programs infrastructure development running their news and telecommunications agencies, salaries, and of course, in their personal enrichment. Sanctions weed out private business while empowering the small military unit at the center of Iranian society and economics. They also hurt capital intensive industries, which require the most foreign expertises, equipment, and tinkerers to operate. Are they really capital, the, uh, capitalistic in, in that sense? I mean, it's not, I guess it's privately owned by the state, by the, you know, Supreme, what do they call them? The Supreme Economic Council, but not really private citizens. Or if it is, then it's somebody that's just totally the back pockets of the council. As a nation of engineers with many untapped natural resources, sanctions hit hard as they push Iran into one of more lower level service jobs. Think about it from the perspective of the average engineering student. Engineers have an outsized impact on economic development, typically being the ones to transfer skills and knowledge between people and put it in the real world. Iran has one and a half times as many engineering students than the U.S. does. A number that's which amazing. Has increased by 2.5 times in the past decade. But because of it's amazing, it's it's like it's such a bad thing for the United States that engineering is down so much for a massive country with the incredible educational resources. But then you have these other countries that are doing these amazing things and they're benefiting from it. China's infrastructure right now is just exploding and leading to their economy, um, just blowing up with that. And the engineering world is uh, is now spread out much further. The United States is very much lagging behind. And there's no reason it has to be that way. No good reason. With education and research aims to be taught without the aid of others, biased assignment of projects, and restricted access to both foreign credit and equipment, sanctions, and domestic loans, corruption, many graduates never end up finding a job. As many as 40% of engineering graduates are unemployed. The country is not so much. They leave the country. They probably it. leave the country then. There's plenty of places that will take those engineers. Absolutely. So they're leaving the country. Is underworked. It's not uncommon for most in a graduating class to pack up and leave for better opportunities abroad, taking what could be their contributions to the country away with them. Yeah. The government can either crack down on these students, as it has done towards student protests in the past, or via increased times to get certification, they could ban students from leaving the country, but it may not work. Around half of 18 to 29 year olds say they would live in another country. Around two thirds think the government restricts the liberties of the youth and over three quarters say they don't see prosperity in Iran's future. Among the- Do you feel, I wonder, how does that compare to other countries? Because I feel like young people are gonna have a very pessimistic view of things. Because when you're a student and you're just out of school, things are very difficult for you, right? There's not just this this red carpet rolled out for you in most countries. So I wonder if those like demographics, would that be the same thing an American would say? Like an American student? Probably. Where three quarters say they like don't... The, let's, let's hear them again. The Think about it. 29 -year -old Let's go back to the when these started. 
Do you think just let's just take the United States for example? Do you think young would say eighteen to twenty nine year olds? You think they would have this percentage breakdown? Work. Check this out. Around half of eighteen to twenty nine year olds say they would live in another country. Around two thirds think the government restricts the liberties of the youth, and over three quarters say they don't see prosperity in Iran's future. Among the reasons the case would it be that far off? Studying at a foreign university is only the top reason among five percent of them. Mm. Other reasons remain highest on the list. Reasons like lack of political and religious freedoms, which are curbed through enforcement by morality police and the Basij militias. Despite this, many are still loyal to the IRGC and Supreme Leader. Ali Khamenei has increasingly built a cult of personality surrounding himself. You have to do constant propaganda. He speaks the word of God to rally up his narrow base of supporters who keep the regime mm -hmm. in place. Theocracy. It's like almost like divine right of kings from the Middle Ages where the state and uh, the the church, you know, are one and the same and they get their power from each other. It is something that is very old in history. You marry religion and politics, you have a long uh, a long lasting regime. As for the revolutionary guard, well, they've grown into a beast in their own right through economic coordination and leading Iran's defense efforts. Yes, they're beholden to the supreme leader, but if he wants any action to be transferred to the country, he needs the support of the guard. So instead of the IRGC trying to wrangle all the different factions of Iran into line, the factions of Iran are competing for control over the revolutionary guard positions. These could be the reformists, all the traditionalists, butt, hello, or the what? pragmatic conservatives who believe in a type of Chinese model, and the more dogmatic sect who strive to uphold the values of the revolution no matter the cost. None of this is to say that the Revolutionary Guard is a homogenous, cohesive unit. It's definitely not. Nor is it a protector of- That's where the coup would have to come from. It's not gonna come from student protests. It would have to come from one of these branches of the military. And that's something very common too, is these coups coming from a branch of the military. You get one leader that one of the, the, the group, um, the military group uh, will support, plus add in some public support. That's now, I'm thinking, if there is gonna be another revolution of sorts, probably how it'll come. A revolution, nor a corrupt group of organized crime. It's a group <laughs> Al of hundreds of thousands of people who, with their current opportunities and conditions they Pulling find those guys out. In, find it easiest to join a brutal and oppressive military to find safety and security. The Guard was given a consensus to rule by clerical elites who uphold their status, business elites who get lucrative positions in key industries and charity networks, and rural Iranians who benefit from the projects they bring. They control much of the trade in and out of the country and are tied to around two-thirds of Iran's output. It's easiest for both government and private interests not to get rid of the Guard, but to influence them instead. The upward mobility either status or money brings them Makes is sense. the main reason the Guard is still so powerful. Mm. Through the systemic corruption, economic issues, and a lack of personal freedom, with little free press and assembly permitted, Iranians of the past have had to express themselves through protests rather than democratic decision making. The protests of 1999, 2009, 2011, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, so there are and many, especially the ones in 2020. So many, there's a reason. reason. Remember so many of that happening when the sanctions got back in 2018 state's grip on political power. The 2022 protests sparked after 22-year-old Masa Amini was killed for not wearing her headdress properly, led to protests in dozens of cities uh, across the country, the arrests you know, of thousands, and the deaths of over 500 citizens. Something I've learned about that with the hijab in Iran, when the, after the Iranian revolution, you saw a lot more of that. Uh, women uh, before that, during the more secular Shah era, uh, women, you didn't see nearly that many women, um, you know, wearing the hijab, the headdress, right, covering themselves up. Um, but what from I've under what I've understood too um, is that a lot of that and enforcement of like the hijab very much depends on the city you're in. Very much depends on the city you're in. Certain even big cities, like difference between like Tehran and another big city, um, could be enforced very different. So I believe that varies quite a bit throughout the country. Nearly 100 died when the 2009 protests erupted after a fraudulent election. 
like the Iran of the past, yeah, these they would like 99 percent short term gain, more of an outlash among a more urban class of protesters rather than a coordinated movement to bring a new set of rules to the country. But any real movement to change the power structures would have the best chance of success through gradual bottom up support rather than top down impositions like the reforms of the past. Well, bottom up support could be a military coup too. Three quarters of Iranians say they wish to see more separation between religion and government and 85% say they're less religious in 2024 I, than they were five years ago. I'm really interested where these he's doing these polls um, and how those got out. Who's conducting those polls? Are they reliable about some very sensitive information that you wouldn't think the regime would be would be conducting themselves about, you know, do you support us? It's like, why would they even do that? Right. Or polling those um, youth earlier about what they think about their economic prospects in the country. So yeah, I wonder, um, does Hoser do uh, citations and stuff like that? I'd be interested to see um, who the pollers are. So there may be that bottom up energy to accompany future reforms. Top down autocratic the policies Shaw. have led to the alienation of millions. The backlash which created the Iran there in both today, regimes, yeah. And the cartelization of the economy and political power. One that without the input of its population has not lived up to nearly its potential. Hmm. All right, so the thesis I guess I'm extracting out of this kind of video essay here is kind of uh, two parts that Iran's problems are the product of sanctions, okay, uh, from foreign countries, and then decisions made by, you know, the Iranian theocratic government, I guess you would say in itself, with an emphasis, though, that it's more on the decision making of the government than outside sources. So like citing that, yes, these, these sanctions, you know, and the decisions to either lift them or put them in have a major effect on the country. But it looks like Hoser is saying there's more of the struggles happening in Iran that should be put into the decision making of the government. That's kind of what I've extracted there. And maybe you agree with me there. So anyways, here are my thoughts throughout the video. I'm uh, interested to see what you think about that too. And with that, we'll see y'all next time.